guys I'm Fifi. I'm an alcoholic. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. I love the thumbs up. I apologize if I keep looking down. My cat is looking like he's about to cause some mischief. So um, um anyway, I'm Fifi. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety day is February 18th, 2018. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor and she knows she's my sponsor. Um, I have a home group. Um, I have several commitments. Um, and um, I sponsor other women and take them through the, uh, <clears throat> the big book and the 12 steps. Um, I am here on behalf of a YPA group. Um, a committee, uh, Worky Paw, which is the Westchester, Orange, and Rockland committee. I'm located in New York. Um, I know there's like people from like all over the place, um, but I'm in uh, I'm in New York, and I'm the chair of Worky Paw this year. Um, so I'm gonna talk about why Paw more than I would normally because I'm speaking for Worky Paw and not my home group. Um, but I'm just gonna get into a little bit about my story, and I'm didn't know I was speaking for 30 minutes. So hopefully I can fill 30 minutes with my story. Um, <laughs> so I'm from a small town in New York called Nyack. It's like 40 minutes outside of the city. Um, I had like a decent upbringing. I think it was decent. Um, alcoholism runs in my family. Addiction runs in my family. I believe I was born with this disease. I am a believer that my mother also suffers from this disease, um, but I'm also a firm believer that only you can diagnose yourself with alcoholism. So it's not really my, it's not really for me to say, um, but I do know that um, she she shows the, the isms and the signs and she has pretty much my whole life. Um, but um, my uncle um, has 15 years sober I remember when he got sober and um, that was like my first real like sight into like real alcoholism and like what AA was and what sobriety looked like. Um, and it's um, it's been a roller coaster the last year. Um, he's been in the hospital since January. He had a liver transplant finally, like, you know, 15 years into his sobriety, finally had a liver transplant. And um, there's been a lot of complications and he's been on life support for a long time. Um, since his liver transplant, um, but um, we keep him in our prayers, and um, the rooms have helped me a lot, and I've had a lot of people in the rooms praying for him as well, um, but he was the first real instance of recovery that I ever saw. Um, I had my first drink to get drunk when I was around 11, um, one of my friends brought a thermos with something. I couldn't tell you what it was. It tasted like acetone, so it was probably vodka. Um, um, a th to to school, and I remember after school, I would um, I would walk home, and we walked home and took turns sipping out of this thermos, and I got hoisted. And um, I remember I went home and I went to sleep and I woke up and I was like, look, I, I want to do that again. Um, so fast forward, um, you know, drugs are a part of my story. I'm not going to touch too much into it. Um, I've just been told I don't have to worry about going to 30 minutes. That makes me feel better. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go too much into the drugs because um, this is an AA meeting. I don't really know what your guys' group conscience is, but I'm just going to keep it to mostly alcohol. Um, but I did find drugs at the age of 13, um, and um, it just kind of progressed from there. Um, you know, mental mental illness is a huge part of my story. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell my story without it. Um, I know there's a lot of I've, I've heard mixed reviews about talking about mental health journey in an AA, in a recovery story at an AA meeting, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell my recovery story without it. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder very young, the age of 14. Um, 
and it was one of those rare occurrences where they were actually right. Um, and so I, you know, thus began the medication guinea pig trial and error and all of that. And um, I didn't mind because I got drunk faster. I got I got drunk faster. The drugs felt stronger. Everything felt more, which means I could use less which means I didn't have to get as much. And I was like, okay, give me seven pills at once. It's gonna make everything more intense. I'm good, I'm good with that. Um, and that's kind of when my my addiction really, really picked up and really progressed. And, and by like age 15, I was like a, around the clock, drinking, using in school and at home and in dance class and, like in the bathroom at my voice teacher's house <laughs> and um just any every, anywhere um and at this time also I um you know I noticed that like I I couldn't remember the last time I actually had a friend I remember my junior year of high school I I finally kind of acquired a friend group um and I realized after I kind of acquired that friend group that I couldn't remember the last time I'd actually had a friend that stuck around for more than a month or two um and that friend group didn't stick around long I of course did something that was catastrophic and um it all blew up in my face and I am very blessed that I've since made amends with with every person in that friend group and not all of them but a lot of them I consider some of my closest friends today um which is that that's a miracle that that's god because i mean some of the stuff i did to warrant them to literally cut me out of their life and swear up and down and sideways they would never look at me the same and talk to me ever again um and now i i just went to one of their they just one of them just graduated nyu and i just went to their graduation um and, and he invited me which was awesome um so fast forward, um, I was a performer all throughout high school. I was a dancer and a circus performer and a singer um, and a musician. I, I was just, my mom and dad felt very safe with me being um, one of the band kids and they didn't know that that's where all of the drugs were. <laughs> um, so uh, needless to say, I was, I was taken care of. My addiction was taken care of on a daily basis. Um, when I would go to marching band from six to eight and then stay late to help clean up. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, by the time I was about to graduate high school is when I ended up in my first facility. It was a psych facility that dealt with uh, co-occurring issues like addiction, um, but I told them I didn't have any problems with addiction. I told them I didn't do drugs and I didn't drink and they believed me. And so they only put me in the psych group. Um, one thing I should tack on is I, there are a lot of people who are like, I was really good at hiding it or I thought I was really good at hiding it. I was one of those those people that genuinely was really good at hiding it because when I got sober, I the most people in my life didn't believe me because they never knew. Even my parents, they just like didn't know. Um, so when I turned 18, very soon after I turned 18, I ended up in my first facility. And, um, you know, I remember them talking about AA would come in and they would go in the upstairs, upstairs living room with the group, with the group ones, which were the psych and substance abuse. And they would go have their meeting and we would go in the downstairs living room with the group twos, which was just the crazies. And we would play categories every night. And I was totally cool with that because I loved categories and I wanted nothing to do with AA. Um, and I got out of that facility um, the day before my senior prom. And I went to prom. My girlfriend broke up with me at prom. <laughs> Um, I graduated high school, but not before one of the girls in my graduating class ended up passing away on the day of our graduation. And then two days after graduation, I was back in the facility. 
um, and thus began the summer of ins and outs, as my mother calls it, um, where I would be like two weeks in a facility and then one week out and then three weeks in and then like five days out and then like two more weeks in. And um, all the while me not getting better and lying to everyone in the facility, not telling them that I was, you know, doing drugs. And I was like secretly detoxing myself in this hospital because I didn't tell them that I did drugs. So they didn't detox me properly. And like, thank God that I didn't die from some of the DTs. Mine weren't terrible, um, but um, I don't know. I don't know how they didn't know. Um, but to the, I'm just losing my words now, I apologize. Um, my mother advised me to take a year off, not go to college, get my shit together, and um, then like go to college once I get my shit together. And I said, no, I just got a huge uh, scholarship to Sarah Lawrence to study film, and I want to go now. Um, so I went like maybe a week after I got out of an inpatient facility, went, moved into Sarah Lawrence, um, was there for about four weeks before I left, drug related left, um, and mental health related left, and went right back into a facility in like early October. And I was asked very nicely by them not to come back, um, by, by the school not to come back. Um, they said that, that they basically put me on a forced medical leave and um, they basically told me, get your shit together and we'll, you can come back. And I, I never went back. Um, <laughs> but um, I went into this facility and I did the same thing I did every time. It was the same facility that I always ended up going to. And um, you know, they asked me if I did drugs. I said, no. They asked me if I drank. I said, no. Um, the only thing I was honest with them about is that I smoked cigarettes. That was the only thing I was like, yeah, yeah. Give me the nicotine gum, please. Um, that's, that's the only thing I was like, okay. Um, and this time I was there for a little bit longer than I usually had been. And I made friends while I was in there with this girl who coincidentally happened to be my neighbor at the time. She lived down the street from where my mother lived or lives. And I was living with my mom at the time and she lived like, you know, down the road and I'd never met her. Um, but we happened to be in this facility together and she was in that group one group with the substance abuse and the psych. And um, <clears throat> so I remember I had confided in her and, and told her that I actually not, I didn't say I had a drug problem. I just said that I, liked it and that I did it often and that I didn't see a time when I wouldn't want to do it and she finally after a lot of persisting convinced me to at least sit in on a meeting so I went to the upstairs living room with them and I sat down and listened to this 70 something year old old fart tell his story and let me tell you I ran out of that room screaming and crying because this 70 year old fart, old fart was telling my story. And I, it was like, there was no way that this old man knew what I was going through, but he did. And um, so I started continuing to go to these AA meetings and then when both me and that other girl got out of the facility, which was around the same time, we decided we were gonna go to AA meetings together. So we went to meetings together, but we would get drunk first. And we thought if we were going to the meetings, no one would think that we were drunk because we were in an AA meeting and we were wrong. I found that out later. No one said it to our faces, but when I actually got sober, people told me that they remember me being absolutely wasted in every meeting that they saw me in um and so fast forward a few months and I decide I am absolutely miserable and I actually really want to try and get sober and she bounced 
she did not want to try and get sober. So I started just going to meetings on my own. And I would go to like one meeting, two meetings a week, sit in the back, get there just as meeting started and leave right when it ended. And I wouldn't talk to anyone and I didn't get a sponsor and I didn't work the steps. And I could not figure out for the life of me why this shit wasn't working. Um, I was like, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just too bad. Maybe I'm like too broken too. There, I'm too much of the problem and AA is not going to work for me. Nothing's going to work for me. But I kept going and I kept trying. And, um, you know, along the way of my ins and outs, I, I managed to acquire a boyfriend and um, he didn't quite understand the severity that was my addiction to no fault of his own. Um, and on February 17th, 2018, um, I had a show that I was in and then uh, it was actually a poetry slam that I was in. And um, someone mentioned my poetry earlier, that's why I uh, specified, but um, I was in a poetry show and then I, there was a blizzard outside. And so I ended up going back to um, a couple's house who I was very close friends with. And um, they ended up having to leave. There was like a, a medical emergency going on. And so they left and they left me and one other person in charge. Both of us are under, were underage at the time. He was 20, I was 18. And um, the minute that the, this couple who owned the house left, um, the 20 year old goes to their bar and starts pouring everyone drinks. And he handed me one and I took it. And I had about a hundred days dry at that point. I absolutely under no circumstances to call it sober, but I was dry and, um, and I took it and I drank it and I got very, very sick. I was, and still am, um, on a medication called lithium, um, which is a mood stabilizer and, um, you, you can't drink on that. I learned that. I, I know now um, <laughs> because um, I got um, something called lithium toxicity or lithium poisoning, uh, where basically my blood became poisonous to my own body. And I was very sick and everyone left me by myself in the bathroom while everyone else went outside, including my boyfriend, to go smoke a cigarette. And when they came back, they found me and had no idea what to do. And the people who own the house came back and still no one knew what to do. And I was like in like a brownout, like it wasn't quite a blackout, but like I remember very little and like it's kind of like flashes and bits and pieces. But I do remember one of the two of the couple that owned, owned the house said, we can't call an ambulance. We can't take them to the hospital because um, they, they're a high school teacher. And um they they didn't want their license to get taken away because I was a minor, I was underaged. Um, so I made it through the night. I woke up the next morning and I remember I went to the mirror and I was just in like my underwear and bra and I went to this full length mirror and I looked at myself and I hated what I saw staring back at me. I hated the person, both the inside person and the outside person. I hated who I was. I hated what I'd become. I looked at myself. I must have been like 85 pounds. I was, and I'm I'm tiny. I mean, I'm only like maybe a hundred pounds now, but like I I was like maybe 85 pounds. I could see every bone in my body. My skin was like hanging off of me. I was, I was like, okay, it was like my like official like this is my bottom, this is my, I can't do this anymore, I need real flip and help. And um, my boyfriend remembered that one of his coworkers uh, was in AA. And so he called her and begged her to be my sponsor. <laughs> and she was like, well, that's not how that works, but I can take them to a meeting. And so she took me to a meeting and, um, and I asked her to be my sponsor. I don't know. I didn't even know what a sponsor was. And quite honestly, I, I thought I had to pay a sponsor for their time. So I was a little hesitant to ask someone to be my sponsor because I was broke. Um, but um, I asked her to be my sponsor and she said yes. We started going through the steps the next day. 
Um, and yeah, I've been on my, uh, my journey of recovery um, since then. And um, I didn't find YPA until about three years into my recovery. Um, my, my first sponsor never had wonderful things to say about YPA. Um, I don't know that she was totally against it. I just think that she she really wanted me to get a good foundation of my recovery before I joined something like a committee, like a YPOD committee. And for those of you who don't know what a YPOD committee is, it's a young people's committee um, that puts on events um, and um, is really focused on unity. It's a service committee. So there's a lot of service commitments involved. It's a good way to get um, involved um, in something like general service or um, doing um, like CTF um, or something like that. Um, and so my third year into sobriety, I was really lonely. I had no friends. I was, I was really, I'm still pretty shy, but like I was really, really shy in my first years of sobriety and I was terrified of talking to people. So I had no friends. And uh, my sponsor had moved to Queens, which is like far enough away that she told me to find another sponsor. <laughs> um, so I had no sponsor, no friends, no network, and I was crumbling. And um, the only thing I had going for me was I had just started a meeting um, right before COVID hit with some people in uh, my area. And I actually was at a, meeting for that group and someone who I've known since I first got sober wasn't really close with um was talking to me about worky pa um and she we went out to dinner afterwards and I ended up sitting next to her and she still tells this story all the time that she said she always says that I looked terrified every time she would talk to me because like I just didn't know how to talk to people and I especially didn't know how to talk to young people because I wasn't really around a lot of young people for those first few years of my sobriety. Um, so fast forward, she um, she ended up, I hesitate to say kidnapped me from my job, but she showed up at my job. She somehow knew what time I was getting off that day. And she said, get in the car, I'm taking you to an event. And so she took me to an event and uh, it was a karaoke event. And um I was immediately hooked because everyone was so nice and so wel welcoming and, and warm. And there was a meeting at this event and then people were just being silly and goofy and fun. And I had always heard of people, people in the room saying, I didn't know I could have fun in sobriety. And it turns out I have more fun in sobriety than I did when I was using. And I never identified with that. Um, and it's because I was completely isolated partially of my own it was my own doing it was my own doing 100% um but um so I ended up joining Worky Pa that year I was their co-career and unity chair and um we ended up um bidding um to host the Eskipa convention which is the Empire State Convention um of young people in AA and that year it was in Binghamton and we were we were bidding to host it the following year. And that was very overwhelming for me. <laughs> but um, I went and I I did it. It was a huge like milestone for me in recovery because I don't do all well with large crowds of people. I don't do all well people I don't know. I'm very anxious and shy and going to a huge convention like that where I practically knew nobody except for maybe half of my committee was huge for me and I did it and I was so 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 proud of myself um and then the following year I was the secretary and then this year I'm I'm chair um and it has been a wonderful two and a half ish three years um being a member of this committee and um I've been able to meet so many people um Something else I do want to touch on um, in my recovery is um, getting sober and having a God of my understanding um, and, and having that foundation of recovery and having the fellowship is 
it really allowed me to handle the bad parts of life that comes with being sober because life gets better when we get sober, but it doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen. And, um, you know, the last like two and a half years for me have been kind of rocky. Um, I, my mental health started to really deteriorate around like year three for me. And then I went into a facility for like a ridiculous amount of time. Um, I ended up coming out with um, a borderline personality disorder diagnosis, which was really hard for me to uh, swallow that. And um, let me tell you, I was in that facility for like seven weeks and I had a visitor almost every single day I was there. And the majority of them were from AA. No one allowed me to feel alone. And that was incredible. Um, you know, I, um, I last July, I got out of a five-year relationship. I had been with this person pretty much my entire adult life. I'd been with him since before I'd gotten sober. I'm now 24 years old and I was 23 when we broke up and it was, it was, it was hard. It was really, really difficult. Um, it was like a whole new shift in my life. And as an alcoholic, I really don't like change. Um, and, and people in the rooms were, were there for me. I really leaned on my higher power at that point in my life. I feel like my, um, my connection to my higher power was really strengthened with that experience. Um, and and my, my point in saying this all is, is that AA allows us to live such a beautiful, wonderful life with such amazing experiences, but it also teaches us and, and gives us the support to handle the really shitty parts of life. And Lord, do I know life has a lot of shitty parts. Um, you know, currently I'm dealing with a lot of health issues. I have um, a connective tissue disorder that's really progressed in the last like six months. And um, and I have felt really detached and isolated, um, but I felt very connected with my higher power. And I pray for acceptance a lot. And that's something that helps a lot for me. Um, because I, there's nothing I can do. And I know that I've been to a lot of doctors, nothing I can really do. Um, and it sucks, but I pray for acceptance. And if I don't want acceptance, if I want things to change now, and I don't want to accept it, I pray for the willingness to accept it. Um, and, um, I think I'm going to stop talking now. I think I'm just talking for the sake of talking now. So thank you for letting me share. <laughs>